So what I'd like to do is uh, perhaps um, kind of tie back to the question that I asked at the beginning of my introduction of the talks and uh, maybe also then ask the uh, different presenters to ask each other questions or talk a little bit about the overlap in uh, their work and then we'll open it up to, um, uh, to the audience and to uh, uh, give the audience some chance to uh, raise some questions. So uh, I think in all your work, uh, what struck me in uh, throughout the talks, uh, the question of illness, death, and decay uh, plays a key role uh, in thinking about materiality and thinking about life and uh, bodies. And so I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit more about how um, uh, you think about that relationship and the in uh, also kind of uh, the effort of redirecting focus of uh, the liveliness of matter. I think uh, both in the last two talks that we heard, uh, there was a very strong push to kind of think about matter as history and as social relations. And so I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit more about the relationship between damage, death, and the livable in your own work. And, um, so maybe, I'm not sure who would like to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, say something. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, for, for me thinking about um, money and about relationships of value, damage, death, and decay um, are not necessarily negative values right. mm. if they lead to replacement, reproduction, next growth. Um, what's the, the frightening thing is to think about sort of freezing or cutting, right? The moments mm -hmm. where there's efforts to, to freeze in time, that flow of, of relationship, that flow of relationality, or to cut off certain relations. So if you think about kind of contemporary Western capitalist money really being an effort to cut off, say, um, the relations between humans and the natural world, um, that's a problem, and we sort of mm -hmm. see the obvious kind of outcome of that problem, which is why these proposals for ecological monies are so interesting. Right. They put the, the, the physical and livable stuff of the planet back into that, that relation. Mm -hmm. So you know, e even, if they, even if they won't fly, it doesn't really matter, right? They bring to mind again that there's that connection. You don't need an ecological money to do that, right. I think. You can mm -hmm. do that with the kind of money we have now. It just takes a kind of uh, flipping on the light switch of that sort of recognition of those other relations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, to me, um, death is, is sort of the foundation of, an, of ethics because, um, because it makes life so valuable. You know? And so um, I, ca I agree with you, Bill, that um, I think it's when you when you try to um, freeze things. I mean, I'm sure at MIT they are. They're, they're finding a way to, to make <laughs> us immortal. Um, but I'm not, <laughs> I, I'm not sure I'm interested, um, you know, despite the tragedies of life. Um, and I, but I do appreciate um, trying to uh, attack cancer cells. Because, um, you know, I've had cancer. Probably a lot of people in this room have had cancer. It's, it's, uh, it's ubiquitous because of all the poisons we put in our environment and also because of the nature of life, really. You know, um, the growth of cells, et cetera, are getting out of hand. Um, but what was the question about damage, death, and decay, and the livable, did I answer? Did I address? I think you're... Um, somewhere there, yeah. somewhere in there, right? <laughs> in the vicinity. Mm -hmm. But I just wanna say that um, when I, I, I'm also a little bit troubled about natural um, capital and, um, and trying to, you know, and just looking at the ecosystems as, as a, uh, a kind of fund of services, you know, be, that can be quantified. And, um, you know, when I propose soil as, as a foundation of a currency, I'm doing a thought experiment, you know. I'm just saying, like, what if, what if value was based on something that actually we need? And that we need to nurture, you know, and that we need to take care of. Like, what if? What would change? What would have to change, you know? If it wasn't like all, you know, actually de facto cued to the price of oil, which is like killing us, you know? It might be worth mentioning the uh, Claire brought one of her ingots with her, <laughs> um, in many ways, materially proving 
the absurdity of the project, right? Do you want to describe broke, the process? It broke on the way over here, <laughs> yeah. you know, despite a mountain of bubble wrap and an oversized suitcase and everything. But it's downstairs, and it's, um, you can touch it. <laughs> <laughs> it smells all right. You know, it's, it's the good stuff. <laughs> Did you want to add something? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you know, from the science perspective, um, I guess the life and death question, you would kind of see it a little bit more um, as a binary thing. Um, but, but you know, I think what was interesting that we were talking about is how a lot of the, the artworks and things like that with the science actually, you know, they decay over time. Yeah. And, it's interesting to think about how to convey those kind of concepts with um, living materials like the soil or like bacteria that mm. aren't necessarily going to be preserved. And, and how does that sort of um, uh, communicate these kind of concepts of death and things like that? Right. So do the bacteria, this is specific to your uh, uh, work, do the bacteria ever misbehave. <laughs> I was wondering about that. <laughs> yeah, they do. Um, so yeah, I guess one of the the biggest things that we fight against oh. is, is their ability to evolve. Mm -hmm. So, uh -huh. you know, we, we do program them and we do try and control them as much as possible, but you put them in some situation like a tumor and they may decide they want to stop making the drug, right? And so okay. we have to try and um, come up with clever ways to uh, prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those ways include things like having them kill themselves when they don't do a certain function. Um, but then there's also this alternative approach of actually allowing them to uh, grow and evolve and to use that as a function and, and a way to direct their ability to you know, treat or detect disease. And mm -hmm. that's what happens naturally. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I'd like to ask the presenters whether they have maybe questions for each other first before we open it to the audience. I'll offer an observation. Okay. I mean, one, one thing that strikes me um, in seeing these presentations in relationship to each other is just how unwieldy life is and how unwieldy the definition may be. Like, is it that which eventually dies, as um, Claire points out? You know, pro probably, right? Um, but I was really interested, Tal, in, in your presentation to understand you know, that it's sort of in the aggregate of the mass of bacteria that they start to recognize themselves mm. um, and fluoresce. Mm -hmm. And that there always seems to be this sort of communicability um, and series of relations, whether it's a circulatory relation or an ecosystemic relation or a bacterial community um, that defines the approach to life through the course of materiality in each of the presentations to that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that most of these functions are happening at the community level, whether it's you know in the soil, there's tons of bacteria interacting with one another. And you know, they talk to one another. And they also are trying to interfere mm -hmm. each other's signals um, to gain an advantage. Um, and they also do these things to form biofilms and aggregates and um, to infect a host to know when uh, you know, a host is not necessarily in the fully immunocompetent phase and to invade and, and do things like that. So it really is, uh, I think, you know, always about the collective behavior of bacteria. And so people in my field are just starting to realize how, how can you start to think about designing ecosystems with bacteria mm -hmm. um, rather than designing a single cell at a time. Do you anthropomorphize them? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's hard not to. But they're, you know, they're, they have different life cycles because, like the bacteria, they divide. They call them daughters, mm -hmm. right? And they continue to grow. And mm -hmm. there, there's not like a lineage like we have. And um, the sense of lifetime is very different. Like you know, cells have these mechanisms where they can only divide a certain amount of times. But bacteria can continue to divide, and they don't have this concept of like a fixed lifetime. Mm. Yeah. 
we made that up. <laughs> I was just thinking about how in both of your um, presentations, there is the sense of kind of a collaborative consciousness that emerges from the interactions of the bacteria on the one hand and then the stuff in the soil on the other. And how do you think about that at, like, at a kind of meta level? What is the kind of collaborative consciousness of the, the mycelium and the plants and the little mm -hmm. bits, of this, piece, bits and pieces of this and that, each of which are also in various stages of, of living or decomposing, right? Mm -hmm. So not all the things in your, in your slide are, <coughs> are alive, exactly. but, but they are because they're colonized by these things that are alive, that are turning them into something else. So there's this incredible continuum here that then right. at this next level has, a, I mean, I'm trying not to anthropomorphize it, but has this kind of other, um, other existence that's really yeah. interesting to think about. It is, and like even like the mycelium, you know, that um, as it extends the pipes uh, when it's growing, uh, it's made of carbon, and so it actually sequesters a lot of carbon in the soil, and um, by d disrupting the soil, we release a lot of carbon in, in our tillage of agriculture. Um, but so it is, it's sort of like it's living and dying, the, the, the mycelium. I mean, it's still like there's the end that's growing, and then there's the carbon pipes that it's leaving behind. And, um, and it's all used, but it, it's not all alive, you know? I mean, it's just really provocative. Can you used like in use or used like used clothes? Sorry? <laughs> like use clothes? Oh, no. Is it not, like in no. use? Well, yeah, it's in use. In use. Okay. <clears throat> Which I guess also is like use clothes, but anyway. Use clothes. Um. <laughs> I also really liked your, uh, the expression, the, the tickling of matter that uh, yeah. you use. I thought well, that that's from good. Kafka. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It is, it is interesting. You know, I, I'm thinking, I just, uh, I'm remembering that one time when I needed a job at one point in my life, um, I guess in my early 30s, I worked for the Bronx Zoo. And um, I was an artist for the zoo and made the uh, artificial um, environments, right? The fake rocks and vines and trees and everything. And it always had this very strange feeling of its, life its lifelikeness just seemed to scream, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. You know what I mean? Like, you look at those environments and see the animals, of course, they have nothing to do in captivity except, like, destroy their environment. So they have to, so, so you have to make these very durable things, you know, like you could actually put the real plants in there, and sometimes they do, but then they get ripped out, you know, and eaten or whatever by the poor animals. And, um, and so you make this, like, thing, and they try to make it as lifelike as, you know, it's very similar to, like, um, I mean, all the techniques are, are, are very advanced, you know, and it, but it seems so, it always feels kind of dead, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, very yeah. similar to, like, whenever you imitate life, it seems so, mm -hmm. uh, well, it's uncanny. It's yeah. the uncanny, right? Um, right? And as we were hearing yesterday about artificial intelligence and, like, will we make it look like humans, mm -hmm. which is so creepy, mm -hmm. right? Um, Well, I think um, we have some time for questions from the audience, and I actually don't um, have the, uh, maybe we'll just use the old technology of simply raising your hand. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think we have a couple of microphones available. Uh, so if there's any questions, please re raise your hand. Hi, I was just wondering, is the luciferin signal strong enough for you to image in vivo or in a tissue section? Um, that's a question for me, I'm guessing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can um, answer. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good question. So um, it depends on the cancer model and the kind of luciferase that you use. So, the question was, could you, for instance, image the bacteria inside of a body or inside of a mouse, and will that signal get out? Um, and, and the things that you deal with are that if something is deep-seated in the body, it, it, it can't penetrate the tissue that well, and it depends on the wavelength that, um, uh, of the signal that the bacteria produce. 
So for instance, one thing that we found is, uh, this is very technical, but um, in these subcutaneous models that, where the tumor is on the skin of the mouse, it's very easy to detect them um, by, by using our uh, uh, equipment. But it, when they're in the liver, in smaller tumors that are more deep-seated, you can't actually see them that well, um, at least in our case. But, but that is um, a technicality of us using a blue luciferase, which is a shorter wavelength. And, you can make it a infrared or, or red color that you could actually see in the liver, which we do with our cells. So I'm getting some signals that maybe we should take one question from, from the, the monitor, but um, I think, maybe someone could read yes. it to us. Or see, do you I, have? I think I got okay. it right here. Uh, if you put see. Uh, Do you want to tell us what, what it is, Natasha? It's Given not, the it's not mine. Okay. Given the democratization discussion yesterday, what do we think about for example bacteria and bacteria? Given the democratization discussion yesterday, what do we think about programmable bacteria is the question. Thank you. Uh, I'll say one thing. I don't want to keep talking, but um uh, so yeah, it, it is interesting, I think. Um, there is this idea of like, you know, if we had this technology, should we just give it away to everyone or allow them to work on it? Um, and there are some issues with that and there's a lot of discussion of who should be doing this genetic engineering, should it be happening inside of labs and institutions or um, you know, even at home or at these community bio labs um, you know, to create your own medicines and things like that. Um, so it's an evolving discussion, that's for sure. Um, where we work right now is more towards the traditional cancer pipeline of drugs. And so, um, you know, uh, you have to develop intellectual property that will be rigorously tested and eventually funded by big pharma because it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to do these, um, you know, multi-center clinical trials that you can get FDA approval on. Um, so, and then at the end of the day, after all of that, it costs a lot of money for that drug, even though for us to make that drug could essentially be very cheap because growing bacteria just takes some amount of sugars to produce. But to go through that entire thing, you end up in sort of a, a less democratized fashion of that uh, programmable bacteria. How do they actually keep, uh, you know, I mean, there are these companies that will sell you samples, right, of bacteria. And how do they keep them from evolving? Mm. Like, how do you have a, 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 like a permanent identity for bacteria? Yeah, so I think the, the most common way is to store, store them in minus 80 freezers. And mm -hmm. those, those kind of samples can last you know, 20 years or something like that. And you have to refresh them. Um, but then the actual pieces of DNA, sometimes those are stored at even um, higher temperatures. Mm. And then you put that into the bacteria. So there are all these, these uh -huh. repositories that companies have. Uh -huh. And um, you can kind of recreate your, your bacteria so it doesn't evolve. And maybe the, the next question is a follow-up for Bill. Uh, what kind of new winners or losers would a soil or nature-based economy create? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it depends on how it's set up, right? So I mean, if it is set up, on the theory of the physiocratic kind of natural limit to growth idea, um, that's the kind of thing that can be perfectly aligned with um, what today we would consider to be a far right gold standard type economy, right? One that is about hoarding, not extending. <laughs> One that is about you know calling in and building walls, not about extending relations and ramifying out. There doesn't need to be a natural limit to growth um, mm -hmm. if we do it right, right? If we can sort of imagine ways for it to be not petroleum based, if we can imagine ways for um, it to be as infinitely extensible as the kinds of relations that we can make with each other and with um, the things and organisms around us. So I didn't answer the winner or loser question, but, but if it's imagined in that, that particular way, um, I think that the you know the winners are those who hoard. Um, the winners are those who, you know, are the inheritors of the world of landed property. Um, 
who basically live off of rents and tolls instead of off of credit, um, so to speak. So that, that's, that's one answer. If you imagined it in a different way, um, really as a, not as a frozen capital, um, but as just another set of relations, I don't quite know how you do it, number one, but then maybe there's some interesting possibilities there for a, a kind of radical democratized money. We've, I think, time for one more question. Uh, there is uh, one other question. Uh, I think that's really about aesthetics, and I was wondering about that as well as I was listening to all your presentations. Um, Anonymous is asking, Claire's work has impact both for its ideas and visceral beauty, uh, but is beauty a necessary component for environmental art to affect social change? So the role about aesthetics. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, and, Did you, would you start that question again? I, um, I, I, so Claire's work has impact both for its ideas and its visceral beauty, um, uh, but is beauty a necessary component for environmental art to affect social change? So what, what, how do you see, how do you think about the role of aesthetics in, in art in kind of affecting social change? And <laughs> well, I have, a, I have a very broad sense of experience, is, I mean, of aesthetics. It just mm -hmm. kind of refers to the quality of our experience. Um, and um, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, like, what, what do you think? I mean, I think <laughs> what we're doing is, what we're trying to do, uh, uh, according to me, is uh, try to reconceptualize a good life. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to have a good life, to live a good life? And this is a cultural question, right? Um, how, how can we reorient ourselves toward the earth, toward our relations, whether they be human or um, with animal or bacterial or whatever? How do we reorient ourselves in a way that, that, um, that, um, that is life affirming? You know, because we live in a culture that's almost biocidal. You know, it almost really doesn't care about life. And what is a good life? Well, is it like cars? Is it credit cards? Is it gasoline? Is it cheap energy? Is it, you know, what makes a good life? I mean, it's the basic question of philosophy. Mm -hmm. It has been for however long, you know, we've Forever. thought about things like philosophy. <laughs> and so um, I just think, so culturally, I think we as artists are trying to make propositions, proposals, like what if this, what if this? And, I, um, I, I love the, the aesthetics of, of things people make. I mean, it's just, it's, it's kind of endlessly renewable. And so, yes, does it have to be beautiful? Do you think it's beautiful? I don't know. You know, like, what is beauty? Beauty is this yeah. very socially agreed upon thing. And it changes, it changes with history, right? Like, who thought that a tribal mask was beautiful in the 18th century? No. That took the 20th century, right? What do y'all think? Tal, I mean, I think in your uh, work, the, you know, some of the bacteria are, you know, they have, pat they make patterns and they kind of design their own kind of aesthetics. And so I'm curious how you think about it. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, I think just as a communication tool, it's very effective to have these dynamic movies and, and artworks and things like that. And so um, we, we do like to think a lot about trying to infuse more science into society. And um, that's obviously important. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I think that the aesthetics play a huge role in doing that, especially like these visual arts um, can communicate in a way that is, uh, you know, it, it sort of transcends language and um, boundaries. And when you start to tell people about DNA and proteins, they, you, you lose them very quickly. Um, but, but with the artworks, you can draw them in and have them see, them, see it for themselves and, 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 and really see like what, what science is about and what the experience is. And so that's something that we think about a lot. You know, John Maynard Keynes wrote a lot about aesthetics and um, has some <laughs> stuff around beauty being the surprise, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's a, th about the thing that moves the person somewhere else than where they imagined they were going to go. Right. So it's a form of displacing as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. I 
think we're out of time. Is so red light blinking? <laughs> <laughs> there's a red light blinking. <laughs> I hear the, I, I should see the sign finish. Okay, so what we'll do, we'll uh, take uh, half an hour of a break and we'll reconvene. Uh, in half an hour for the next at panel at 11 o'clock um, for the next uh, panel, which is invisible. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you.